Okay, welcome back. In today's video, I'm going to make several bins. And in my process of making my ice picks, which is a product that I sell on my website, I end up with several parts and I need bins to organize those parts. So here I'm using Baltic birch. This is three quarter Baltic birch, comes in five by five foot sheets, makes carrying them a little awkward. And I'm breaking down my material just showing you all the different sizes I need to recall. And I'm making short sides, long sides, and bottoms all together. Now we're going to do a blind dovetail. And my table saw doesn't have an outfeed table, only because I keep it in this big open shop. And in here, I like to move it around a lot. And on occasion, I use this bin to just catch whatever parts coming through. Occasionally, if I use long stuff, I'll have a couple of horses set up on the opposite side. So you can see how many different parts I need. I need to double up on all my longs and all my shorts. And I'm just giving a count there, every pair of longs or every pair of shorts indicates one full unit. Now I'm just doing a quick palm sand, getting all the fuzz off. Because when I want to get ready for my dovetail jig, I don't want any fur or debris getting in the way here. Now I'm using my broccoli dovetail jig. And one of the most important things when using a dovetail jig in my experience is keep everything organized. And here when you do these blind dovetails, you cut the joint at the same time, meaning both sides of the joint at the same time. And everything comes in the kit, the flush cut collar there, that brass collar. It fits most routers. It fit my port -a cable no problem. And when you get this, it's really important to do some test cuts. It takes a few minutes to get your mind wrapped around exactly what has to happen. You have to visually understand what's going on. And here I had to adjust my cut with the dovetails either tightening or loosening. It depends on which way you lower the height of the cutting head. It will give you a looser tenon or a tighter tenon. And I can't reiterate it enough is to keep the parts organized in your mind. You'll see what I ultimately go to as I lay them out completely in front of me. As if the box is unwrapped laying out in front of me. And for me, that was the best way to keep it organized. I had from left to right, one side, the back side, the next side and the right side. And I would write on them. One, two, two, three, three, four, four, and then one again. And then you could imagine it was unwrapped in front of me. And it was the best way for me to keep it organized. It took me a few minutes to get that system going. And thank you, my friends over at Typon. And here I'm able to like my first couple of boxes, again, just before I was able to get my fully organized system down. And I like this dark type on. Gives you a dark joint, like darker than three, much darker than type on three. Just inspecting my first one. You can see I actually have a couple done already. I did a few off camera. And now this is where I developed that system that I described. where it's laid out in front of me. And I make a bunch and then I put them together and then I make a bunch and then I put them together. But it's those first few cuts that are really important to experiment, especially if you have limited supply of wood or you're using a hard to get species, I would highly recommend experimenting on some scrap. You need to get your mind around the spatial understanding of what's getting cut when and in what order so you don't waste material. And then another thing to become good at when you use these type of jigs is to understand how to make a repair. If, for instance, you cut something off a little bit, how to put it back together, maybe you could hide a mistake here or there, which I'm not going to lie. There's a few mistakes hidden amongst all of these joints. But 
a wise man once told me, a professional is just getting better at hiding your mistakes and not telling people about them. So one, two, three joint, four joint, and then one again. So that helps me remember how to put it together. And then with the number facing up, that also tells me that that's the inside of the box. And by keeping them numbered, it, it helps knowing what I have to put back in the pile and what I have to flip over and what I have to grab and what I have to put back and so on and so on. I really like these blind dovetails. It just really classes up anything you're doing. It really makes it look pretty. And then you develop techniques so that you're climb cutting and you're limiting your fur coming off of your plywood material. And looking back at this edit, it seems like I've folded time back on itself a few times here because it seems like that pile's not getting any smaller and neither is the pile of boxes. It's not getting any bigger. But I wanted to make a bunch of shop bins that were sturdy and look good because I need to keep these around for a long time. You'll see by the end of the video just how much weight these actually have to hold. Full of ice picks, each bin holds about 40 pounds worth of brass. And here I'm sanding, but if you notice, I did a little trick there with my squeeze clamp. I put a loop in the palm sander cord, so I never had to turn the palm sander off, because I had to make so many moves, let go, and then keep making moves in my vise. And having to turn the palm sander on and off so many times is really distracting and time-consuming for it to wind down so you could actually put it down instead of it jumping away so I just let it hang in space while it was running now here are all my boxes I did have to go back and fill a couple of little spots but not a lot honestly not a lot and then I have to make the bottoms and I do a, a curious thing with the bottom I just inset it just a little bit. I inset it just a little bit, but then I put a bevel on, say, what is half of three quarters? Three eighths. So I have three eighths nailed into the box, and then three eighths gets this bevel on it. Now that's so that it could puzzle into the top of the open box below. So I'm making nesting boxes with a simple joinery. It's just a butt joint in there. Not the most elaborate strongest joint in the world and there with my little jig I'm able to throw some nails and I didn't really want to get crazy with putting glue on everything so I left the glue out but I just put a lot of nails and there you can see how those stack I didn't want to go crazy with glue and get it all over everything knowing I wanted to paint it later with some polyurethane but having that little T-jig inside of the box helps me be able to see exactly where I need to be. And then working on the steel flat surface of the top of the table saw, knowing everything's going to line up nice. It's a bit tricky putting those 18 gauge brad nails in there, making sure you're landing where you want to. I have to admit I had to pull out a couple that went astray. I typically just break them off. They break right at the surface and they usually stay below the surface. Now this is an interesting little jig. I didn't want to bore everybody with a CNC machine. And so here, I'm just cutting out what's going to become a template for the router jig using that brass collar. And I just cut it all the way through just to get rid of the entry mark on the bandsaw. So you cut in, cut your shape, and then cut it completely in half, and then glue both sides together, and you'll never see your your cut line. It's really more for cosmetic than technical stuff. I actually had to fortify that joint a little bit because it broke in one of the cuts. So here you see I'm, I'm fully engulfing the side of the box so I know that the placement is where it needs to be each time. If you'll notice I glued some wood down the sides of that joint just to fortify it because it did break after one or two. And the good thing having the brass collar on your router is you know you're not going to wear out your jig. Brass collar 
allows the bit to work independently. It does not ever interact with, you don't have any moving parts against the router template. And this way you just get a nice little inset, I flip the box, and the template being exactly the same size as the edge. helps me understand that I'm landing in the right spot every single time. Yeah. And just keep an organization in front of me. And I try to land it. And once I realize that if I can keep it at a certain depth, I can land it inside of the plywood at a, at a color break. So it looks different. And that's what I'm trying to do there just so it looks slightly different. There you go, this is a fun one. Now my branding iron. I wanted to class them up a little bit with some branding because these boxes always live in the background of some of the shots that I'll be going forward with. And so here, with hot iron branding, it's really important to burn it a little bit, over burn it, and then palm sand it back. It really looks pretty. And I learned that at the Louisville Slugger factory of all places. Years ago, I went on the tour of the Louisville Slugger factory. And when they burn the logo into the baseball bats, they look very similar to what that just looked like. Over burnt, hissed and steamed out, and then they sand it and it looks really perfect. And this is my Rockler sprayer, which has seen a number of jobs <laughs> you can see how beat up it is. Just putting some polyurethane on it. I put one layer, raise the grain, sand them, and then put another layer on. But this is really more just to protect it from handprints and grease, which it's going to be interacting with. So again, these are shop bins for my manufacturing process. These are not bins that are going to go to a customer or really ever going to be involved with the so-called public. These are just industry bins. For me and this sprayer works great no compressor low volume just forced air never clogs always sprays well but you got to keep it clean I have a wrap with a rag because I was shaking it like crazy and it was coming out and here you see the shop bins filled with some of the product I sell on my website, ice picks. Each bin holds about 150 ice picks, large and small. So you can see the, the amount of duty these boxes are going to be put to. By now they've all been fold and unfold a few times and they're standing pretty strong. Thank you Rockler, I hope you learned something in this video.